Hi, I'm Rich Bowen with the Open Source Program Office at Red Hat. Earlier today, I had a chance to talk with Ohad Levy about his work in open source communities. Specifically, he started a project called Foreman. Foreman is a complete lifecycle management tool for physical and virtual servers. And Ahad will tell you a little bit more about what that actually means in a moment. That ended up becoming the core of a Red Hat product called Satellite. We talked a little bit about what's involved in starting up an open source community and what's involved in leaving a community and letting other people take the reins for you. So here's that conversation and thanks for listening. We are talking about a project that has celebrated uh, 12 years or will celebrate 12 years, I think. Okay. I'm, I'm maybe losing count. Okay, in, in a nutshell, the project started, um, you know, like most probably like many other open source projects where uh, there's a need. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't any other project out there that did exactly what um, was needed. And um, at that point in time, I worked for another company and we were, you know, uh, typical enterprise challenges and, and in particular managing lots of infrastructure. So the idea was to try, well, two things. For me personally, it was the first time I felt like I can actually contribute back as a long, you know, yeah. many years open source user. Um, I, I really felt like I have something to, you know, uh, to give. And um, I um, started, you know, kind of, uh, uh, I went to a conference uh, back in the days was about Puppet. So it was, I guess the first, I was a Puppet user back then. Um, and it was uh, the first Puppet conference in 2009. And um, I had a whole presentation basically on, on how I deploy Puppet, or, you know, Puppet users kind, kind of thing. But I, there was also back in the days where you had sticky notes and people would put, you know, names next to what the topics they want to hear or talk yeah. about. And others will kind of chime in or, you know, plus one kind of. Um, so I did mention like I, you know, I bought, basically started, started, started building a management system that, uh, in, in its essence, um, helps organizations to manage lots of infrastructure. So what does it mean? Basically just for the you know, basic building blocks is everything around uh, provisioning, uh, everything around integration to infrastructure that you might have, uh, you know, DNS, uh, whether it's Active Directory or Linux space, provisioning obviously of Linux servers and, and uh, Windows a little bit um and uh, integration with configuration management asset management and you know user based role access control all the things that you need if you have a larger operational team how can they uh, basically enforce standardizations but also provide simple to use or relatively simple to use basically automate as much as you can uh, mm -hmm. from the the job allow self serving basically to build systems that you can expose later on to customers. These were only the early days of cloud, you know, so most organizations yeah. did not adopt and the self-service notion of, I, I just want some service and I'm just going to consume it directly was really in the beginning. So it, it was a lot about integrating with whatever makes sense. Um, and a lot of, you know, people like to integrate, um, you know, things that they built or things that, so it was, the mindset was very much about pluggability, meaning everyone could, uh, in the beginning, it was, you know, great success very quickly. So just sorry if I'm kind of jumping, but um, it, it its user base grew very rapidly early on. Uh, I was happy to be able to piggyback on an existing community, which in this yeah. case was the, the Puppet community. The What we did basically to visualize all of the puppet infrastructure. So, you know, all of the inventory of your machines and what, and later on, we kind of allow you to classify the machines. You know, this is a database, this is a web server. It has this settings or that settings, you know, kind of made it a very low entry bar for people to um, just see their infrastructure. So if you're a puppet user, basically you got a nice UI and reports and what's happening. So that grew the user base very quickly. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the amazing thing happened that 
your user starts becoming developers. Uh, you know, you start getting your patches. I still remember the first patches that, you know. Yeah, that's always even, exciting. Yeah, very exciting. And I remember, you know, that old, but it was before pull requests were a thing. So yeah, uh, we were still sending patches over email. So, you know, the barrier is even higher, right? People really want to contribute uh, if you're sending patches over email to a mailing list. Roughly around the same time I started working for Red Hat, completely, you know, not connected. Oh, obviously, I was uh, known as an open source developer in that mm -hmm. context. Uh, but, you know, I just started to work um, at Red Hat. And while the community is kind of growing, um, I joined an effort back then to start building the successor of, you know, we had never mind the name, Cloud Engine. And, and we started working on a similar system management solution for Red Hat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the convention, you know, basically when Satellite 6 was the replacement for Satellite 5. We had already an, uh, an existing project uh, that did the content management, all the RPMs, um, syncing and mirroring and, uh, and, and so. You know, we had a provisioning system with Cobbler back then. And, you know, I just mentioned it as like, I, I own my, you know, I have a side project, an open source project that I maintain, uh, and it does similar things. And I'm more than happy, you know, kind of to adjust it or to try and fit it to the, what we need with, with satellite. And, um, you know, it, uh, sheer luck or, or, or um, <laughs> you know, a uh, win-win kind of situation where uh, the community kept on growing. Um, so, you know, it was kind of a, I guess, safe, safe bet or positive bet from Red Hat to basically start using it. And the way it started was basically in a, like a backend, uh, you know, driver, the, the, the driver yeah. that does things. But as we continued, we saw that, um, you know, we, we put the existing project and the new project side by side, and we made like a single sign on across them. Uh, up to the point that it, somewhere down the road, we basically pivoted the whole thing and just created uh, the content aspect as a plugin and, and created basically Foreman as the upstream of Satellite 6. Now, the journey to Satellite 6 was not easy. Um, and this was mostly because of one kind of, um, you know, reality in terms of upstream and downstream. There was simply different entry paths into the product. Uh, you know, so satellite was, I'm, I, I'm basically, I want to manage content and, yeah. and, uh, Foreman was about, uh, how do you do, you know, provisioning and configuration management. Um, so the entry path from a community perspective was very trivial. As I mentioned earlier, you just install it and you start seeing your infrastructure, but the RPM aspect was basically didn't have that mileage, let's say it this way. Uh, so that created a lot, quite a lot of friction over the years. It took a few good releases before Satellite was really um, accepted, I guess, by our customers. It was a big thing to yeah. migrate to Satellite 6. I think it, only in 6.2, it really became like something we really recommended our customers to do. But still, you know, it, it created an ecosystem of, you know, now basically, I, I don't know the statistics because I've moved away from the project, which is also very uh you know not trivial thing to do but i think um uh, after seven years or so i, I decided that um, i don't want to do it another seven years mm -hmm. um but you know I, I i stayed attached and i think on the you know i tried to contribute for many years at least one patch every release i can you know there's a lot of small side stories for example the story i like telling is the fact that uh with my previous employer um, I, I asked, you know, before I started Foreman, there was some code base that did something similar conceptually on a high level. And I went to my boss and I basically asked, do you mind if we open source it? And like, I'm like, it's not our, it's not a secret sauce. It was a semiconductor company. It was, you know, and, but basically his feedback was if someone uses it in the space station and it explodes for whatever reason, like. Is there what's the liability for us kind of thing? And I was like, okay, I, I really appreciate this manager back in the days, uh, and I like him up to date. But you know, that was my okay. I know that I need to start looking for a different company that will appreciate 
um, you know, open source, not just from a consumer perspective, but also as a community perspective. And, and yeah. you know, to make a long story short, I think it was a couple of years later, again, probably on, on Puppet Camp or one of those big conferences where SpaceX came to the, you know, stage, their keynote speaker, and they were telling about their usage of Foreman uh, in across all of their infrastructure. So I had like this small moment of, aha, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. uh, um, yes, it's maybe, I don't know, it's actually in space, but it helped maybe. <laughs> Overall today, I don't know much about the statistics, but I'm I'm still hearing every now and then about success stories of people yeah. using it. Um, you know, people that, it, that build significant infrastructures. We have lots of companies. So the, the nice thing about it is organically, you know, without a lot of business investment or anything like that, it, it did create significant amount of um, companies using it, uh, mm -hmm. companies, you know, offering services and, you know, kind of consultancies and, and development because of the plugability model. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies actually can write their own plugins and keep it uh, and not publish it. So it's not necessarily a good thing. But on the other hand, there's, you know, a rich ecosystem of uh, integrations and, and extensions. Like, I, I do feel proud that, you know, made something that makes a difference, at least yeah, to some. Absolutely. Um, and I hope it, you know, I have an, another opportunity to do something similar, right? The fact that... Uh, it's not un it's easy to un underestimate the effort of building a community making sure yeah. people are happy the right balances between accepting patches that you you know different from what you in in initially thought but you know see how it actually can grow or sometimes adds a unnecessary complication so you know different uh, what's the role of a i'd say a maintainer in the early stages of a of a project and how it shapes whether the community is i don't know so i don't know if i did it right or wrong whether it could be done better but you know kind of uh, all kind of um, dilemmas that maybe would be interesting to you know look at a new project with that back you know kind of experience and and uh maybe i'll do a few a few things differently what advice would you give to somebody you know looking back if somebody's starting a project, what advice would you give to them about how to shape the community? So I think that by far the easiest thing is to piggyback an existing community. The assumption that you can go write this awesome you know, project, put it on GitHub, have a wonderful web UI, and expect people just to show up mm -hmm. is, is um, I, you know, it has to be a subset of a, some other community that uh, will understand where you're coming from, because otherwise maybe sometimes that's just too vague or too big, invest in integration or invest in where, basically where users are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you, I think developers comes, I mean, sometimes you can just go and it's appealing for other developers, it really depends on the kind of project we're talking about, whether it's a you know, project that is, who are the personas at the end of the day, but spend some time thinking about your users, your potential mm -hmm. developers, what 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 are the barriers to entry or you know your where are you losing people, right? Like uh if a hundred people show up in your website, uh how many of them can actually move on to the next step mm -hmm. and, and you know the funnel basically of uh of being able to find you. I think in the early days it's a lot it's a lot of emotional connection, like personal connections. Yeah. Uh, you know, users trying and you're supporting them until they're successful, that creates connections. And then that's also helps them um, become your advocates down the road, right? As, as, uh, as, as they are becoming more knowledgeable, there's like, a, once you have, you have this emotional investment, people then you know, it's kind of, a, mm -hmm. you know, maybe in, a, in today's world, it's like a virus, basically. <laughs> Keeps on spreading, right? Uh, but maybe in a positive connotation. How did you create an environment where somebody moved into that leadership position? What, how, how did that transition go? I resisted the urge to, you know, to voice my opinion on every possible yeah. opportunity. And that's hard. It's hard to let go of that. It, it is. I extended trust as much as I could in terms of like, 
it wasn't an easy kind of like um, you know giving the keys to the kingdom uh, uh, but but you know kind of trusted folks and um, it, you know in, in some of it was inevitable like we had so many users I you know I couldn't scale like that that was part of it like I I, I was burned out even from the amount of contribution and I I was a bit fanatic for quality. So it was very hard to no no we'll fix it and we'll I, I I knew that everything that I accept as contribution means that I need to support it mm-hmm. uh, you know and that random contributor might go away um, but um, it's it's about trust again that connection people have yeah and then we build up you know we use a lot a lot of really great people that came along the way and helped shape like uh, you know the contribution guides and how to become a maintainer. And what does it mean to be a maintainer? What's the expectations? And what's the process? How, what's the process also be, you know, eventually uh, losing your maintainership status? Um, and, and, you know, kind of created a clear understanding for everyone uh, what's involved. Again, maybe there are better ways or easier, or maybe, you know, we got to a point where we didn't scale infinitely, right? We, we, we had a good base of developers, and then at some point in time, we didn't keep growing, right? So um, I don't know, maybe other projects will handle that mega growth better. But yeah, trusting people and letting others fail, I think is crucial because yeah. uh, otherwise they'll be afraid and not take you know, a leadership role. Well, thank you. And I guess we're out of time, but th- thank you so much for sharing this story. I, it, it's always cool to hear people's people's journey through that. So. Yeah. And it's, I guess, the probably, you know, if I look back on a period of time, um, creating community, creating this project is probably one of the f- most more exciting mm-hmm. things that you wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, I had a uh, uh, my daughter was, you know, a baby back then, and, and you wake up in the middle of the night, and, and you're maybe feeding her or whatever, helping her, uh, and at the same time looking at emails, trying to figure out what <laughs> happened, and you know which PRs yeah. came, or you know what happened in the last three hours that I was asleep. Like a very exciting period of time, and um, very rewarding as well. 